Good morning. I'll be with you in a moment, dear. All right there we are good morning okay that's good white white is a good good color <clears throat> so I'll, i've continued to accessorize by like adding some little scarf flare nice i like it turn and on my volume you probably can't see but i have i have my little skull oh. earring nice destroyer theme well shiva is the lord of destruction in one way, but I guess in another way, to appeal to the Catholic in you, oh. no resurrection without crucifixion. Okay, I like it. Mm -hmm. I like right. it. So how are you feeling, getting any jitters or are you nice and calm? A little of both, a little bit of both, a little bit of both. So Gail might pop on here. Um, oh, I probably don't need to be recording this yet, right? No do the chanting and the centering right now. So here's our mudra for today. It's called Kilaka Mudra, K-I-L-A-K-A, -A -A, Kilaka Mudra. Why don't you say that? Kilaka, Kilaka mudra. mudra. There you go. And here's how it's done, very simple. You're gonna cross your wrists, so your right wrist is closer to you than your left wrist, and your palms are facing the side wall. Hi, Nancy. Good, hello, good morning. Then you hook your right pinky finger over the base of the left pinky finger and you touch your thumb to your middle and your ring finger, and you stretch your index finger straight up in the air. Parallel, yeah, unless you have like an arthritic joint like I do. But stretch it up anyway, best as you can. Okay, and then you hold it down, level of your heart. Kilaka, it means bond, B-O-N-D. And so in some way from the um, Ayurvedic point of view, this is supposed to be a balancing energy for your kidneys. Um, from a psychological point of view, it's supposed to help you feel safe in emotionally intimate situations. And then in a spiritual take on it, this is a way of balancing Shiva Shakti, as they would say, masculine and feminine principles that are sometimes associated with um, the yoga, a yoga dyad, right? Like yin yang, a yoga dyad. So welcome, Maureen. How are you? Good. So everybody got that? Or do we need to go over it once again? Oh, wave your fingers at me. That's nice. Okay. All right. So close your eyes, drop down into your center, get clear about why you're here. Get ready to go further. Oh. Yogena chitasya padena vacham 
malam sharirasya ca vaidya kainam yopakarottam pravaram muninam patanjalim pranjali ranatosmi abahu purushakaram shankat chakrasidarinam sa ashra shirasam shwetam pranamami patanjalim arihi om bow your head Salute the essence of yoga within yourself. Keeping the eyes closed, bring your head up on your spine. Release your hands into namaste. And gently open your eyes. Oh, I'm so glad that we're all here today. And I hope that you're glad to be alive, because I am. And uh, if you're not, well, I hope this class helps you to feel a little bit more alive and safe. Let's see, any more people here? Welcome to you, Sarah. Uh, I see your face, but not the actual live video. All right, so this is where we are today. Um, if you want to continue to hold Kalaka Mudra for a while, because remember, if you really want the subtlety of what would be the electromagnetic currents that are supposed to be connected when you do the various kind of Hasta Mudras, hand positions, you got to hold it, so they say, there's no empirical evidence on this. So they say five to 45 minutes. But if you're like most people, first of all, you said, I hate sitting still. In fact, I detest it. I'm used to like being stimulated and doing things and always on the move. So I don't like sitting down. Besides, I'm not really one for internal practices. That, that's a good excuse. Or, or my body, my body physically isn't up to the endeavor to sit every single day for just 45 minutes. You know, all these reasons not doing it, but yoga is supposed to poke a hole in the denial of all those things and just say, come on, we're here to practice and go a little deeper. And uh, right, remember Tivra Samvega and get all over this if you really want to close the gap between when you put the time in and what you get back from it. If you're, if you're dull, if you're mild, if you're average, or if you're keen, it'll just take longer. And again, uh, I've suffered enough. I want to continue to minimize or reduce to the extent I can suffering and then not feel so compelled to be drawn into the uh, social net all the time. And I am in the social net, right? But it's really important not to make myself an algorithm for Silicon Valley. Does everybody understand what I mean by that or need to go into it further? It's okay, remember to say, I don't know. There's no stupid questions. Okay, so today I'm going to do a PowerPoint PowerPoint presentation on one of my favorite subjects, me, no, just kidding, um, yoga as the magnificent obsession. I love that word. It's a magnificent obsession. You get gripped by it. You could say it's like a positive addiction. I can't do without it. And once you understand what I would call the ritual aspect of it, the symbolic code that you could choose to read into it or project into it, then it becomes something without which I can't face my daily life. And I'm never saying, of course, that you have to only translate what I'm trying to get across through yoga terminology, but I'm using yoga because we're all interested in it as our public interface. But then you have to take it into the subjective way you can interpret it in your life and wrap it in a contemporary package so that we use the ancient wisdom and remember what I call domesticating your intuition. In the old days, you know, there was very few people who had access to all these things. You just kind of muddied al muddled along if you weren't one of the elite or one of the educated. It's only been relatively recently that we have, get this, bequeathed to us the whole legacy of human history and information up to now. All there for the picking. The only truck I have with is, fine, watch a tutorial on, uh, on uh, YouTube about how to plant bulbs, but then get out in the garden and get dirt under your fingernails. You know, keep living in prime time and, and don't let the fact that technology is here to stay completely control your life. Or as I like to say, don't take your cell phone into the kitchen or the, or the table when you're eating. You don't need another notification. And, you know, and I'm not saying you should be a cop and tell other people not to do that, but lead by example, unless it really bugs the shit out of you, then say, hey, can't we have a, a thing here without interfacing with technology? You know, it's almost like, I have to get Jewish for a second, my Catholic friends, Sukkot is coming up, the Feast of Booths. Now, I don't know what it means to you, and I never came from an Orthodox home, but I get the symbolic import, right? 
for seven days, you're supposed to have these makeshift booths open to the sky and you stay there and live there and eat there and you don't have anything in it because it's supposed to remind you symbolically of when Israel was traveling in the desert and they had nothing, nothing. Everything was provided for by the spirit. All you had was each other. You didn't have a lot of possessions to lug. So you had to be with each other, sleep with each other, eat with each other, learn with each other, talk with each other, and that's it. So they ask you symbolically, if you had to go on a journey like that, what would you take with you? How lightly would you travel? Because it's always going to come down to, well, things are being provided for me. I am so freaking appreciative. I have such gratitude for everything in my life. So what would you take with you? Who is the most important possession? Can you possess another person? Who do you appreciate so much that if you had to spend time just with them, right? Would it be your, your spouse, your kid, your best friend, yourself? So, you know, yoga, it's, it's really beautiful. The bond that you make in yoga first starts with sitting still, effortless being. Have you heard of the word esconced? Come on, anybody shake your head. You know what it means? I'm a university professor, $200 word, esconced. Your sitting practice is where you get esconced, which means you find a safe, secure place to shelter in, and it becomes a fortification behind which you renew yourself. And of course, every asana is supposed to be a way of touching the core of being, which is another way of saying being ensconced in the essence self. But certainly when you do pranayama or meditation or even study in a certain way, right, there's more stillness, right? Asana is variety and those other practices are much more monotony. But you have to get comfortable instead of pestering yourself why you can't do this. So the Magnificent Obsessions, my PowerPoint is going to be all about. And for me, again, for the new people who haven't studied with me, you know, there are certain things I say again and again until you get it because they're really powerful and usually based on my steal often and steal from the best. Everything I say is probably ripped off from somebody else. Very little originality here. So one of my teachers, Ram Das, used to say, everything I say is all about me, but there's nothing personal in it. So the teachings I'm giving, obviously, in one way, are subjectively important to me, right? You always teach what you need to learn. So I'm owning that. But at the same time, I've been taught by my teachers to try to find what my interpretation of the through line that it's not just true for me. Because once I understand the symbolic aspect of it, it's true for all human beings. Just like yoga makes claims, or they would say states facts, and then gives you techniques on how to experience the fact. It's up to you to find out for yourself if it's true, if you want to invest that much time in finding it out, going down that road. So for me, one of the first things that started in my life long before I got into yoga was studying the psychology of conditioning. Not only conditioning from the early 1900s, when advertisers and marketing really started understanding how to manipulate people and create what's called manufactured consent. And if you don't know anything about that, a little tip for the politicos out there, Naum Chomsky, if you don't know anything about Professor Naum Chomsky's work from MIT, he's not popular in the United States because he's such a critic about the shadow of the United States that he's only popular in other countries who want to hear the truth because their life doesn't revolve around the United States. Nonetheless, as it kept on going, you know, psychology can teach you a lot of things that are not just about what happened in your early, you know, Freudian year trauma kind of stuff. No, it can also teach you about how the system, the culture, the ethnicity, the family has a way of inculcating, or you can say conditioning. I don't like to say educating. It's more like instructing. I always like to differentiate instruction from, from education. As someone who spent almost 25 years at the university level, I got a little input into this. Instruire, to, stru to instruct, means packing in. Packing in. What are they packing in? Information. Has nothing to do with you. 
not interested in you. Just put the answer on the paper. When was the War of 1812? Very good. 18, good. You're, you're an A student. Unless, of course, you watch Jay Leno's Jaywalking. Have you ever seen Jay Leno's Jaywalking, where he, he, re, you know, he asks people randomly in the street, so um, where is the Panama Canal? Russia? Where is the Great Wall of China? China? Yes. Where is the Panama Canal? China? You know, okay. So stuff like that. You know, and you're as wow, wow. This is a cross section of how poorly educated we are. And again, blowing my horn, I came through the New York City public education system. One of the best liberal arts humanities exposure up until the end of high school, even though as a, as a student, you're constantly whining and complaining about all the work and the teachers. So yeah, but what, what an, a beginning if you choose to go to college or not. Okay. So when you understand what conditioning is, you want to really understand education because education is not packing in information that has nothing to do with you. And that's why you're bored to tears because it evokes no passion in you whatsoever. And then if you're like many of the lemmings, you end up with a job just over broke. And when you do that, now it starts, I start bleeding into another thing. You live a provisional life. You just get enough provisions to get you by. Nose just above the pandemic borderline. I'm happy. But just below that, my soul has been dead. I stopped dancing, laughing, believing in myself, whatever, because the conditioning shut me down. But if you're educated, educare means to lead forward from within. An educator is supposed to help you find the thing that turns you on. Or as I like to say, the dream whose pursuit, dream whose pursuit is self-energizing for an entire life. Welcome, Greg. That's the Dharma to me. That's the highest thing I can conceive of that's being brought forth so my next most emergent radiant self can live large and give my gifts. So that means I have to try some things because how do I know what I like? I could, you think like a baby comes in, have some spinach, but you never had it. Well, apparently there's a part of it that knows right away. A priori, before experience, as opposed to well, taste and find out. Oh, a posteriori, no, mm, reasoning, I don't like it. So you try this, you try that, but we all have natural inclinations, right? We all have things that we are inclined to our own nature, whatever it is you love, bike riding, playing with your dog, frisbee, cooking, gardening, skiing, whatever. It gives you a clue, or as I like to remind you, what did you love to do as a child that you could lose yourself in mindless play for hours at a time? There's a clue. That's the kind of stuff that you wanna lead forth from within yourself. You're not second guessing yourself. You're not doing it to impress anybody. You're certainly not trying to monetize it in any way. That comes way later. Social coordination comes way later. First, that find out who I am I, what do I like, what's important to me, what values are significance. Now, can you study that? Can you read about it? Can you ask? Sure, but there's also natural inclinations, and that's what you want to find out. And a good educator recognizes that in you. And then, of course, at some point, having a teacher or a mentor is very, very helpful. Somebody who's a little further along the way than you. You love violin, so you get a teacher. And they, they teach you things about how to bow and how to hold the hand correctly and what's a good instrument to have, depending on what level your practice is and what kind of finances you have, all those little nuances. And they guide you and they inspire you because they love the same thing you do. And you see what it's like when, when you're further along. And that's what we call the, asp the, ins the inspiration to aspiration. You see someone else who can do it, I want to be like Mike. Because we're all from Chicago, right? And you try, and again, I say this almost every other class, right? Remember Michael Jordan, he set the standard. There's nobody else around him to compare himself to, to compete. He had to raise the bar himself. And yet he also says, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. And he missed over 300 game-winning shots. When it was on the line, people went to him and he didn't do it. But obviously it didn't stop him from continuing to aspire to his own standard of greatness. All right? And uh, I always like to say this for the people who um, get too extreme in their views. One of my favorite Gestalt psychology ripoffs is 
perfection is a yardstick with which to beat yourself. So you can always create a standard that you fall short of and feel really bad and just add it to the pity pot. Just one more thing to be ashamed about. But yet, does that mean you shouldn't have a high bar of what you're trying to achieve yet? So my teacher says it very, very simply, right? Perfection is perfecting. It's an open-ended gerund. Like any art form, the muse demands of you a lifetime of commitment till the day you die, till the last breath is happening, till you can't do it anymore because you're not really different. You are it. You, you are embodying the spirit of whatever that thing is that you love to do. And then you're truly in what I call competition with your teacher, but not competition like two people in a tennis match where you need an opposite side in order for a game to exist. No, this is petitioning the same God, goddess. You're both facing in the same direction. Hmm? That's the competition you're in. And of course, teachers want you to go further than them, do better than them, take, take off where they finish. That kind of legacy, right? Like running, running the, uh, the race where you, you pass the baton to the next person, they take it and they do their next leg and you pass it on. So we're all involved in this climb and lift thing in this magnificent obsession. Take a hand from the people above us, let them help you pull up and then reach your hand down to the people coming after you to help pull them up. So the whole conditioning thing can be exposed and worked on. And again, I can't say that every bit of past conditioning can be erased any more than you write a, a pencil line on a paper and then you erase it and it's not there, but there's still a trace, isn't there? Well, some of those traces still run very, very deep. And if a person's had some horrific experience, they got kidnapped, they got raped, they saw their buddy go on the grenade and kill them, but not but they stayed alive, or you left your, your, your kid at the pool and all of a sudden he drowned. The amount of things that could happen to you and be that for the rest of my life, I'll never be able to forget that this happened to me or I did this, whether it was perpetrated on me or I perpetrated on somebody else. You all understand you have your own version of what comes to mind when you think about that. So there are different ways, different modalities that people can try to heal themselves. And again, even if they do heal themselves, they carry some kind of scar or remnant with it. But if you're not educated and you don't know either that you can do that or that if the shame you carry is great, you're worthy of doing that. Like we always to say, like to say to the little child or little teen in you that got shame, like it wasn't your fault that it happened. But now as an adult, it is your job to get out of there. And then you have to find right modality for what it is that you're trying to fix, right? Because a, you know, a marriage counselor, a divorce counselor is a different kind of psychotherapist that you need than if you're an eight year old and, and your, your mother and father just died in a car accident, you need bereavement counseling, right? That's different if you're a post-traumatic stress syndrome person from rape or war or violence in the street or whatever, you understand? If you're just on a personal spiritual exploration, maybe you need a very different kind of psycho psychologist, right? If it was creative dysfunction, sexual dysfunction, financial dysfunction. I mean, you understand? Each one of us needs to be healed and not in just one category, yeah? And that's why I like yoga because it's an umbrella teaching that provides so many different alternatives. And again, once you get the idea what they're saying, we're not limited to Eastern philosophy. Everything is open to us because tantrically speaking, if we're dancing with everything, what form isn't divine? Nonetheless, that all leads you to understanding what I call the barbed wire of the mind the barbed wire of the mind. It's a phrase I picked up from Krishnamurti. If you haven't read Krishnamurti's teachings, I highly recommend you look at him. He's the man who coined the phrase choiceless awareness. One of the simplest ways to understand what meditation is, choiceless awareness. He also has some fantastic videos with the physicist David Bohm, B-O-H-M. Their dialogues are fantastic. And even just to look at physicists' point of view, this guy's another uh, giant in the field that I would recommend. But the barbed wire of the mind represents the part of you that once you touch up against it, ow, ouch, ooh, conflict is the beginning of consciousness. But of course it hurts when you touch it. So what's the natural inclination when there's a barb sticking in you, when there's pain poking you, you pull back, you back off, you contract away from it, you protect yourself. You feel the threat of going further into it. And, eh, eh, I don't want it anymore, brah. But of course, that's the coward's way. 
And that's why some of you have been with me, you know, I say, run to the roar, run to the roar. Face the very thing you don't want to. The Buddhist meditation teaches lay it out really clearly. Two kinds of suffering. The one you run away from and the one that chases you and then the other one which you turn and face yourself. Balls in your court. So a lot of what I do is trying to bring up the subjects that are uncomfortable. Uh, you know, I'm an old Aristotelian rhetoric man. So for those of you who like you know, spend time in, in school, you know, you know that, that I'm trying to persuade you. I'm not pretending that I'm being neutral here. I'm trying to talk you out of believing the story of uh, CNN, MSNBC, <clears throat> any alternative news, you know, all things considered, all the same story with different interpretation. Yoga tells a different story. Yoga has a different teleology. Its aim, its goal is a little bit different. And of course, let's not confuse it. Still put away whatever you need for your 401k, whatever you think is gonna make you secure. That's not yoga's goal. So this doesn't make you abdicate or deny your responsibility as an incarnated being. We're not talking about that. We're talking about other focus, the education focus. First, lead yourself out of whatever kind of bondage you know you're in or whatever you think is missing, try to define that better and better. What do you think you need that you don't have now, right? And then most important, right? Can you generate from that educational place? This is where celebration and joy comes from. And let me go back a little bit here. When I said you get safely ensconced in a posture and it's a kind of fortification, the importance of feeling secure. You cannot have joy if you feel threatened. So at least in your practice, sitting on the magic carpet of your mat where you can fly anywhere you want, that's the time to nourish yourself and allow the passion to come through. Because when you get into the world, it isn't always as conducive. And later on, can you get, a, can you get better at manipulating the game board so it's more conducive? For sure. So confronting the negative stuff, whether you do that through your reading, through your dialogues, through a therapy um, group or an individual therapy, just through observing yourself, it'll come up. I always say, start with the asana mat. You'll see the discrepancies, the lopsidedness, the asymmetries, the weakness, the inability to do something, the whiny butt that doesn't want to put the, the time in or the aggressive one that wants to push through regardless of what your body's telling you. You'll see all the states of consciousness right there. Then the game is to learn from that Right? This is basically intelligence, studying intelligence. We could call it intelligence squared. And then you bring back the gift after you've done the hero's journey. Right? You separate yourself from the world temporarily. You do your work. And then you confront the test and trials of whatever the dynamic of the work brings to you. Right? In the old days, it was what getting the Ten Commandments, the Golden Fleece, cutting off Medusa's head, killing the Kraken, you know, whatever mythology, same story. And then what does the shiro or the hero do? They bring it back to the community for the service of the community. They contribute it and they reincorporate to daily life. So you want to celebrate, hit the mat work. At the same time, you'll find good things happening, tremendous release in the body. Many of you heard me talk about the dose the four brain chemicals that you're going to awaken when you practice yoga, dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, and endorphin. We want those feel-good chemicals because that grounds you in the here and now. It takes you out of remembering anything from the past, however useful that may be at times. But also, if you don't do it correctly, the ghosts of the past keep barfing all over your life. Yeah. And it also takes you out of anticipation of the future. It's nice to have goals, good to have something to look forward to, but both the remembering of the past, the anticipating of the future are just thoughts in the here and now. Yeah, use them definitely and intelligently, but come into the here and now, which will always mean action and stillness. The two aspects of the eternal, eternal stillness, eternal activity. They're one and the same. They can't be divided. That's the unity. You're bonding to that. Kilaka mudra, Shiva Shakti, you understand? Weave these things all together so it's one harmonious whole. 
everything is doing, everything you're doing is to take you to that state of non-duality. So I like to talk about these things, as you heard me say, because my teacher said you have to be a Yanadatta, give some knowledge. And I like to give some knowledge about the yoga technique. And then I like to give knowledge about general stuff, right? So since I want to make sure we get at least, and we started when this was 11. Is that when we started 11? And we, we go to one. Thank you for giving me the extra half hour. I really appreciate it. All right. So one of the things that I like to do is continue to spin what I consider the American Dharma, the American Dharma. Um, just recently, I've made, I've accepted the critique that there's a, a big difference between doing yoga for humanistic values and doing yoga for dharmic values. So once again, there's a very, very different story. You know, those of you who've been with me, you know, when I shift like that, you see the mirrors, remember you're getting a reflection on the small self, your personal psychology, and then there's the big mirror to try to get into empty mind, shunyavashta, find out what happens when consciousness doesn't have any thought. That sounds like an oxymoron to begin with, right? Choiceless awareness. Anyway, Humanistic values means I study yoga because it's good for stress management. It's an aspirin for my mind. It helps me get calm. It helps me get clear. It helps me to concentrate. Wonderful, wonderful. It gives me energy. It helps me sleep better. My, you know, once you start talking about all the different systems of the anatomy that you could say are benefited, cross-discipline, right? Nervous system, digestive system, hormonal system, immune system, right? And like, it's a pretty powerful statement. It has nothing to do with dharmic values. And I'm not saying that those are not good ends in, of the, in and of themselves, but people who are living for dharmic values would simply say, well, that's getting your foot in the door. That's making you understand that the less sick you are, the less preoccupied you are with having to take care of that stuff because it kind of pushes itself into your face, you can't not pay attention to it. But if you didn't have to pay attention to it, your energy would be freer to do what? You know, the yogis say to turn to the dharmic values. And the dharmic values have much more to do with what we would call liberation or freedom. They use words that are hard for us to understand, moksha. Because when we say freedom, we think about, no one's gonna tell me what I can say or what I can think or who I'm gonna be with or how I'm gonna dress or what my, my, my sexual orientation is or what music I like. You know, we want that freedom to be whoever we wanna be. And then we all want the freedom. I wanna be freedom from, uh, freedom from uh, aging and freedom from being dependent on my kids or freedom from you know, whatever it is, right? Free from things and free to, none of these have anything to do with moksha. So when you're living for dharmic values, your mind is on a default set to something very, very different than the daily grind. Does it use the daily grind? Absolutely. What else can you use? That's the prima materia, as they would say in alchemy. Right? That's the gunk of your life. That's what you work with. So if your daily life is your main path, all of us who are householders get this, right? This is not the time for you to live renunciate values. It doesn't mean you can't understand what renunciate values are as applied to daily life, but sometimes they seem really inconsistent because, for instance, renunciate values would leave you a lot of free time to practice whatever your sadhana is. But if you're living your householder life, have you noticed how many hours of the day it eats up? <laughs> Well, you better get your head screwed on straight and your heart open. Otherwise, you'll be resisting the fierce grace. As I always said, if you don't realize that the people in your life, however different from you in thought, feeling, choice, action, whatever, is a sign of the grace of God in your life, you need to talk to me on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Because it's all designed on one level to trap us, and then on another level to give us the very means to free us. 
So yoga becomes supplemental and complementary. Complementary means yoga adds something to the life of the householder. And supplementary means it actually gives you something that finishes it correctly. So now you understand how to live your life in a spiritual way at a certain season or stage of your life without thinking that you're missing anything or doing it like kind of grumping along, whining, mumping, complaining, rather than realizing the opportunity that's providing you to continue your spiritual practice, even though it's in, 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 the, in the heat, you could say, right? The heat of the daily life is like the heat of the monastery. They both have their own kind of fires. So you want to purify yourself. How much do you need to read in yoga before you hear these words? Purifying the nadis. Purifying the choices you make so that the karma that you have in, in relationships with other people comes back relatively cleanly, harmonious, filled with more peace and goodwill and blessings than with human beings who rub you the wrong way and environments that don't really feed you or serve you. Your life starts unswervingly moving in a better direction based on humanistic values. But then you keep applying this, you keep lifting yourself above. And this is why we all understand having any kind of self-help, yoga is a, like an apothecary of self-help, things you can do for yourself. And you can also, of course, get together like this and satsang with other people. But there's a lot you can do for yourself and a lot you gotta do by yourself. Because remember, if you walk into the bookstore and you say to the clerk, where's the self-help section? And they say, well, if I told you, that wouldn't be helping you. So I can only share certain things and then the ball's in your court. All right. So now, uh, I really challenge you to confront the part of you that's full of shit. Everybody has a place in them that's holding. I was, I was just saying to uh, Laura before and Jennifer at the beginning of the class, one of the things that I love to confront in myself is what I would say is the first three lower chakras. Now, why are they called the lower chakras? Is because you can get into a lot of trouble when you don't want to accept what the particular spin of these instinctive aspects of ourself are, which is why they're called lower. So first, second, and third, I call them, I ripped this off from Joseph Campbell, the malodorous, lecherous, and carnivorous self. They never go away. Each one has a me too voice, which will bug you to no end if you don't pay attention to it. And of course, all the chakras have the potential for being turned up, awakened. The Kundalini can be aroused if you want to use their symbols. And it can take you to seeing every perspective from a higher point of view, not a lower point of view. But you're still going to be involved in pissing and shitting every day, dealing with your sexual fantasies or your erotic nature, or clamping it down, trying to pretend you shouldn't have it because other people told you this is bad. I don't know why spirit is so interested in your sexuality as opposed to anything else, but we've all been conditioned. And then third chakra, ravenous winner. I'm going to consume as much as I can and make everything into me, turn everything. I'm like a rapacious predator. Wow, I don't want to see that part of myself. But I'm telling you, self-preservation, you know, getting your yayas out and, uh, you know, making your mark in the world, it's instinctive. So can you at least be aware of it so it's not just a knee-jerk reflex that happens before you even think? Remember one of my one-liners, Buddha is a master of putting the reptilian brain on a leash so that the dharmic values now aren't, pun intended, trumped by the lower level of focus but you can never not focus on it. You know, one of the other things that says, I don't know what nirvana is. The, the blowing out of, they say, one translation, the blowing out of the flame of the selfish desire game, right? Um, and if you study the three tests that the Buddha went under, that basically were like desire, fear of death, and social obligation. 
the idea that you can become, be, you can go beyond it. I think that's, it's, a, it's an escapist party line I would like to believe. But because I have a critical intellect and I don't want to wish that were something were true, and I do wish it were true, but I do understand that anytime I say, I wish it were that way, I believe it is that way because leaf in belief is the same word Anglo-Saxon from to wish for. So when you believe anything, you're really hoping it's that way. You wish it were that way. But most of these things, of course, are not in the realm of empirical science. So we either have to take the word of an authority and then find out by doing it ourselves. And of course, the path is long and arduous and most of us don't want to do it. So that's why we believe it's true. We hope it's true. We wish it's true. But what I have found is I have never been able to get beyond desire, fear, or social obligation. And even though I know my teacher says he has not gone too far, that's why I'm saying that. But what I have understood is I'm not compelled by desire, fear, or social obligation. And that makes such a difference in the spin of how I meet things that attract me and seduce me and how things make me push them away from me because they're not good, more barbed wire in my life. And then things that seemingly force me to have to do certain things with relationship with other people out of obligation. But once I realized, yes, I'm going to be involved in desire, fear, and social obligation my whole life, but I don't have to be compelled by it. And then you do the best you can as each of those things continue to manifest through your melodious lectures and carnivorous self. And then hopefully we can get some aid from the upper chakras, which as you know, you don't think that the heart with the search for truth can be perverted. That there aren't more murders by people who know each other than by drive-by shootings. Or that people don't quest for the truth and become fundamentalist fanatics, killing other people for their belief and so on. So it's not like the lower chakras are, the, are, are solely to be blamed for unintended consequences of negative karma. It's rife in every chakra, which is why clarity of mind is supposed to be one of the things you're developing so you can see and discriminate and understand the choices ahead based on what you've done in the past. So, magnificent obsession. I think I'm gonna share my screen. I'm gonna take it away and let's see what we can do. That's not negative obsession, did that happen? Give me a moment, I'll be back in a moment. Gabriel, before you switch to the um, PowerPoint, can you yeah. say a little bit more about how you understand social obligation or defining that? Sure, by the way, you are recording, aren't you, Laura? Yes. Okay, good. Well, first of all, as soon as you say social, it means your connection with other people. So, you know, I guess, I don't know if you can prioritize any of these things, but you have to think, so who are the people you're involved in? Well, of course, A, it's gonna be your family. B, it's gonna be, if you're a student, it's gonna be your school obligations. Um, if you're in the workforce, it's gonna be either you're the boss and you have employees or you're self-employed, or you have people who you interact with because they're part of how you monetize whatever you do. Uh, I guess you'd be very different if you were an individual entrepreneur or you had two or three people as opposed to if you worked for a corporation and you were just a department, you know, in a large institute and so forth, right? There's social obligations that could be with your religious tradition. There could be social obligations that you do if you have a, a group of friends that you meet with on an ongoing basis, whether they're your satsang for yoga or your book of the month club or, okay, so each one represents relationships that to some extent are defined at least clearly so you know what you're supposed to do you, you either you've negotiated and there's an agreement about what how you're supposed to show up or there are certain kinds of conditions that happen just as a result of well this is how it's done and it's never completely explained to you but you know the, you know the, let's say the kids kind of pick up and now six o'clock is when we eat dinner and we always eat at the table and we don't watch tv or you know whatever it is. So now obligation, that's a good word. That's where you feel what is it to be obligated to someone. You feel beholden. You feel committed. There's something that makes you feel like my word is my bond and therefore I'm obligated to do what my part is. And what is your part? Well, again, you play a different role. You have a different social persona, which to a great extent isn't just something you create, it's something that we all get conditioned into learning. This is how a mother shows up. This is how a boss is. And depending on who your role models was, right? It can be smoother or it can be kind of bumpy. 
And then, you know, you add your personality and your own kind of karma to what you've learned. And then it comes out in, you know, how you interact with other people. And I'm sure you realize other people don't think like you, feel like you, want the same as you, as, are, are as quick on the uptake, can't be as articulate as you, and a whole bunch of other things that makes the game, you could say at its best, exciting, exciting and wonderful to magnify human experience with the other levels of creativity, if you can find a way to jam with the other person. But again, it's a two, you know, double-edged sword. You know, it can not only be just other people who are like total nincompoops or morons or like, you know, boorish people and people, boy, I'd love to shoot your tires out of it. You know, all the volatility that other people bring up in me. I don't know about you. Maybe you, maybe you've calmed the demon. You know, I still got to sublimate a lot because I'm from Brooklyn and a lot of things piss me off. My conditioning gives me a short fuse for people who are fuck ups. Okay. You know, I want, and I want to, I want to be the avenging angel really badly. I really want to give it to each one of these people really badly. But I've trained myself not to do that because I've been down that road. It's not the one I choose to go down anymore, but I don't pretend that I don't think it anymore. I just, I just have it on a short leash, okay? Or as the story of the Zen master goes, when a student says, it's unbelievable, how come you never lose your, your temper? He says, what are you kidding me? I lose my temper all the time. He says, I've been with you for 20 years and I've never seen you speak an angry word to anybody. He says, I know, but I get it back so quickly you never notice. So I don't try to grill myself with the perfection of I'll never be angry at anybody again. Whether it's the people closest to me or people who I don't know who seem to be doing something or saying something that I find offensive. But then a lot of it also has to do, what do I want to do with my attention? And so in terms of obligation, you know, each, well, each person pushes different buttons, right? Each person triggers you in a different way. So, uh, it's a very general question. If you wanted to ask me something specifically, I could respond specifically, but I'll tell you a specific for me and maybe you can fit into it. When my mom was getting old and I was really getting concerned about what I could do to feel closer to her, even though there's distance, we live in a different city and she's not as sharp on the phone anymore and blah, 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 blah. So I went to the priest of St. Giles, Father Dorr, when he was still there. And I asked him what to do. And he said, you know, I did this with my mother and I found it was really helpful. Just call her every day. It didn't make me feel like I was a mama's boy that I was asking this question in my fifties. My Just call her every day. Little things mean a lot. And that's all he had to say. And I did. And I called her every day until like, you know, the phone was just up in the air. She couldn't even understand who I was, but it didn't matter. It created a certain kind of closeness. So I felt obligated but the obligation then turned into a desire. I want to do this. So there wasn't a drag. Oh, I got to call my mother. No, the time is short, right? The sands of time are running out. So I took advantage of it and didn't feel obligated. And it shifted the whole psychological approach to that. Is that helpful? Yeah. So in each one of those situations, where you feel it. You have to assess what's being asked of me. Thank you. Do I need to re renegotiate the agreement? It's not written in stone. I can change. Even if it meets with some flack, I can change. If this is not working for me, be honest. Be honest. Nobody wants you there pretending. They can smell it. Even if they, even if they, haven't, even if they haven't developed parachitanamam, parachitayanam, parachitayanam which means the clairvoyance that can see into another person's mind. They will get your judgmental attitude without you saying anything because it wafts from you like, like a perfume from a flower. So you think you're like an ostrich with your head under the sand. They don't see you. They'll get it. So either renegotiate. All right. Let me see if I can get this back up now. Magnificent Obsession, share the screen. There we go. All right. Are we rolling? Yes. Very good. Confucius. What does he say? Well, if you read the Tao Te Ching, I don't know 
if we would call it a holy scripture in the same way we think of the Bible, the Quran, or the Gita, something like that. But certainly we could say it has an oracular function. It's trying to connect certain levels of uncertainty that's looking for validation or guidance. And since their system has the idea that there is an overarching harmony above and behind, below and through everything called the Tao, and it is perfect order. And somehow human beings are capable of aligning with this perfect order. And it seems weird, how is it possible to know what happened in the past and then somehow predict certain potential future events that haven't happened yet? And one of the images is like in, in astronomy. In astronomy, our scientists have been able to figure out, if you want to believe in their empiricism, that what we think of as the universe came into existence out of nothing a number of billion years ago. And they've done tests that are able to, from their point of view, reconcile a theory about how it came about, the scientific genesis story. And as a result of having understood, by having seen its effects in what shows up in reality, they're also able to predict things like, when will there be an eclipse? You know, or, or when there's a, you know, a Mars retrograde or Jupiter return or whatever, astronomically, not astrologically, astronomically. And of course, from the measurements of what they understood about the past, they can predict future events. So this is what we're really trying to do when I call about domesticating intuition. We're trying to look at the clarity of our own mind's potential to see what choices did we make in the past and how do they end up with what we're experiencing today in reality? And how can I predict based on the likelihood, here's my own inner algorithm, what I'm more likely to choose or what I can see from my patterns I shouldn't choose and how might I be able to better predict what's gonna happen in the future as a result of that. So creative awareness in every situation, that's what we're looking for. All right, so, oops, not stop the video. So now I'm gonna to go to my next slide. Tell me if we're working. Yes, we're good. All right, so here's Ram Das and Nim Karoli Baba. So for those of you who don't know his story, it's really interesting when he got kicked out of Harvard from too many LSD experiments with Timothy Leary. And then he took the path to the East and he found this guru who got him on a different path, changed his name to Servant of Ram. And one of his first things to get you out of your thinking mind is, I'm not who I thought I was. I'm who I think I am. So you gotta change the thoughts and you have to go get out of what I would call Cartesian dualism. I think, therefore I am. No, the yogi says, I think, but I'm not my thoughts. So who am I? Well, initially be whatever other thought, whatever other thought you put in, other than the thought of who you thought you were, because that ain't who you are. And this is what psychedelics do. And I, I wanna open this up to the group. If you have any young people in your life who uh, you, know, you can't talk to about psychedelics, send them to Uncle Gabriel. I'll be glad to like talk to them about the psychedelic experience and the ins and outs, the dangers and the benefits. But you understand it's about changing through chemistry your perception in life. And what the first thing it does is it shakes your whole view of what we call material reality. Because when you get out of your mind by a psychedelic drug, whether it's ayahuasca or LSD or, or peyote or mescaline or shrooms or soma, whatever it is, you realize life as we know it is only relatively real. It isn't absolutely real. So you're no longer holding on to it or identifying with it, or as they would say, clinging to it in the same way. So already it goes against that klesha, abhinavesha, clinging to life and fear of death. No, you've already had a death. In order to perceive this, you had to let go of the old stuff. It had to die in a certain way. And you think that the new reality is much more real, but then you awaken to the realization that it's also only relatively real. It's not the absolute either, but it's shaken your view of the first reality, which you thought was absolute, now it's only relatively real. Ah, we have now shifted to dharmic values. What is the real reality? And as I said before, it ain't the one that CNN, Fox News, and all things considered are pushing. Those are just different interpretations of the same reality. It's something beyond it. It's finding the Tao, or moksha, or Brahman, or whatever word you want. Now, to do this, 
The point of living and of being an optimist is to be foolish enough to believe that the best is yet to come. Like so many other things I'm saying, it only really pertains to me, but I hope there's nothing personal in it. If you live what you believe, even though I seem to say your belief is just a wish and your hope is a, hope is that way, remember in Swadhyaya, your faith has the power to create that which you have faith in. Living what you believe erases so much self-doubt. So that's why when I speak to you and I say I want to persuade you, the first thing is I'm sharing ethically. I'm owning myself. This is important to me. I'm just being honest to make the connection. I'm not trying to tell you about anything but me. But if I've tapped the humanity in me, then I'm going to empathize. What I'm saying empathizes with what's going on in your life because this happens in everybody's life. And then I'm trying to use the images and the words to connect to the logos part. Ethos, by saying it's important to me. Pathos, by connecting to the feeling that you know you have. And then logos, appealing to rationality and the cohesion of a tight argument with polished converse that gets to you and makes you want to hit the mat. Make a list of things that make you happy. Make a list of things you do every day. Compare the lists and adjust accordingly. Sometimes we say, rule number one, commit myself to well-being in everything I do. Rule number two, see rule number one. <laughs> or as the Buddha says, incline your mind to well-being. Make the search for wholeness, for truth, for integrity, for peace, for harmony, for goodwill, whatever word you want to use. Make that the default existence. That's why I say when I, I get up in the morning, the first thing I do when I realize my eyes are open is I start with a praise of gratitude. Thank you so much. Even if what about, I have no idea what I'm about to face, even though I may have some idea about schedules, because I always like to keep that open-ended thing. Anything that could happen to a human being could happen to me today. From the most wonderful, my enlightenment could just be a blink, a blink away, an eye, a blink in the moment away. Or the most heinous thing could happen to me or someone else I care about or the world itself. I, I'm in no control of any of that, but I'm open to it. So until that happens, and remember, happiness is something you bring to the world, not something you get from the world. So that's why you want to find out, what do I love to do? But strangely enough, here's the dualism. How will you find out what you love to do? You'll have to explore the world. So in some way, the world affords an opportunity to you to discover these things. And then when you discover them, you bring that back into the world. It's a pretty nice interaction. It is an interactive universe. All right, so now, am I good enough? Oh my God. I cannot tell you how many people carry these shame, self-worth things with them. It's horrific. But if you voice your passion, the shadow part of it is always going to come up. And it's going to try to sabotage you. So run to the roar. Face the stuff you don't want to face. When you begin the journey, you may not feel the inspiration or you feel that the inspiration is inadequate. But playing small doesn't serve you. Playing small shouldn't be the all-consuming voice in your head. Run to the roar. Become aware of what you resist, especially when what stuff is thrown at you and you wish it was easier. Teachers don't make your life easier. There's an African proverb that says, when you find a teacher, it's like walking in the rain and trying to get out of the rain by jumping in the ocean. The teacher will help bring on the problems quicker, more, deeper, more challenging, like a PhD. Now I'm piled higher and deeper than I was before. So love your art form, find your own path. Anybody out there have seen Barbara in Yentl? She loves studying the Torah so much that she disguised herself as a man. To what extent are you willing to go to find your own path? And remember, stepping into your power gives you support for your truth. And ultimately, no one else can support you for your truth. It's just between you and the spirit. And remember, you and the spirit is a majority. So you got to live your path. Now, you can find so many reasons not to practice. I want to get this clear. This should be the epitaph on my stone. 
hit the mat. More questions will be answered by direct experience and practice than just by intellectualizing the path. And at some point, if your Hatha yoga is part of your self-education, you have to stop listening to other people's ideas and work the field for yourself. Now, oh, there I am. Yes. I just want to criticize my pose. Laura, you see how low my knees are on my lower tricep elbow? Have I not hiked all the way up so that my bottom knee is tucked into the back of my right upper armpit? I see it. That's why my teacher would say, you think he's doing the pose well? He's not knowing. He has no idea where the action really comes from. And then, of course, he'd ask me to be sure. Do, do you know what, what you're not doing? No, sir, I have no idea what I'm not doing. And look at my thumb. Look at how my left thumb index finger is planted flat. My right, in the, my right thumb is up off the floor. He has no grounding in his thumb. He does not even know. So he would teach me like that. But, but it didn't shame me to not practice. I would go back and I practice again. Because practice has its own momentum. Sometimes it waxes, sometimes it wanes. But if you don't practice, and especially if you say, I don't have any time for practice. Anytime someone says that to me, I know how desperately badly they need the practice. But I don't grill them because I understand there's times in your life where things are overwhelming. You just can't do it. I get it. Practice has its own momentum. Get back to the mat as soon as you can. And then remember, transformation is in baby steps. It's gradual, 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 little bits, little bits. Chunk it out. Before you know it, you'll be submerged in it. It's, it's like you're not, yoga is not like a shower where you get it and all of a sudden you're just soaking wet. It's like walking in a mist. It, be, it can be going so, so nothing special, so ho-hum. You don't even know anything's happening. And then before you know it, you're thoroughly soaked. There's no turning back. I always like to honor my teacher because it's the joy of movement. It's not a competition against anybody. It's challenging yourself about your own personal best. It's trying to find out where's the frontier. And within your limitation, are you unlimited? Can you keep coming up with new innovation and creativity for your whole life? Asana provides a lot of variety and it'll help you when you get back to the monotony of sitting still. So I love his definition using the gunas. A, a, a workaholic is a, excuse me, a alcoholic is a tamasic person. And a workaholic is a rajasic person. And a yogaholic is a sattvic person. A, sattva, a yogaholic is a sattvic person. So I love that. Anyway, go out in nature. Don't take your computer with you. Don't take your cell phone with you. Find your satsang. People need to be in community, even if it's scaled down in some way. People want to move. The joy of movement. Do something. Don't make the mistake because you can only do a little. You do nothing. Do something. And then remember, disappointment is just the action of your brain readjusting to itself to reality after discovering things are not the way you thought they were. So that's called disillusionment. You gotta, you gotta let yourself be disillusioned because when you stop and think about it, it means you were living under an illusion. And it may have served you at some point, but if you saw anybody else living under an illusion, you would say, you're, you're fooling yourself. But it's not, it's not true for you. It applies to other people, but not you. That's called Maya, the magi magical apparition of how reality appears to be, but it's really something different than that. We take it to be other than what it is. That's called Viparyaya in yoga. So last but not least, after Geppetto died, Pinocchio supported himself by working as a washroom attendant. Now, you, you gotta reinvent yourself, everybody. Oh, you like that one, Laura, huh? You gotta reinvent yourself. You have a lot of skills that have nothing to do with yoga. So go deep into your education, face the barbed wire fence, don't get scared of it. Run to the roar and keep hitting the mat. All right. I'm done. That's it for today. See, oh, one hour and two minutes. Boy, life can go by so fast when you're pontificating, can't it? Now, did anybody understand or did you realize the legacy that I've incorporated from my mother? No. My mother was a master of talking without breathing between sentences. So, oh, you got that, Muriel, very good. So I, I guess I picked it up. Anyway, thank you. Now, we're not sure if spotlighting Laura will enable the video 
to show up with her because we don't want it, as I've understood, if we only pin the video, then you only see me, but we want to see her and record. So now we've done that. Can everybody see Laura Lodge? Yes, hold on one second. If I go to gallery view to see any of you, can you still see Laura Lodge or did I turn it off? You still see her lot, great. And if I go back, everybody still sees her? but not me? Yes. I love it. Look at, how, look at how well we're doing on Zoom. Let's compliment ourselves in this new media. Good job, Gabriel. Good job. By the way, do you know that Laura and I are color coordinating our outfits to each other? She has the white and the gray. I hope you're getting it. Soon, soon, soon we'll be accessorizing together also. We'll be, match, ma we'll be wearing matching earrings and stuff like that. All right, so today we're doing a, part, a practice called sharpening the edge. Do you all have a belt? Well, get it and stand up. We're starting with Tadasan, even if it was in a different part of the uh, sequence before, okay? All right, so first please watch Laura as she stands in Tadasan with no help. Yeah, put, put the belt at your side. All right. Now, if jo you can do this, this part you can do with her. If you join your feet together, the base of your pose is narrower. So notice that. Now, if you're wobbly, by having your feet together, you can slightly put them apart hips width. It'll change the angle of your shin and maybe you'll feel more balanced. Fine. But I want you to notice that the classical pose of Tadasan requires the legs to be together. Now, if you look at Laura's legs, right, you see the space between her leg. So from her inner heel all the way up the inner calf, inner knee, inner thigh to the groin, the legs are not together, are they? Laura, tell everybody, are they together? They're yeah, not together. They're not together. So if she bends her knees enough to make them touch, right there, stay. Now she has to learn to squeeze her legs together as she slowly straightens them. Oh, she's doing a much better job than the first time we went through this. Right, but tell everybody how difficult that is on your body. It is difficult. Where do you feel it? My thigh bones. So would, wouldn't you like to just let it go so you don't have to work that hard? A little bit. Yeah, okay, give me the honest answer. Just say yes. Okay, fine. All right, so that's, see, that's what you want to see. She just let the, see, that's why, because she doesn't have to work. She doesn't have to work. So now I'm going to give her more cues. So everybody with me, bend your, stand up, touch your legs together. And if you're not completely touching the inner knee, Bend the knees however little you need to to make the inner knees touch. Come on, Holly, more. Holly, bend your knees more and touch. Now stop there. Put your hands on the side of your hips. Stretch your arms down. This is not a muscular action. It's an energetic action. From the thumb to the bicep, energy moves up. From the tricep to the pinky, energy moves down. On the back of your body, move the spine from bottom to top. But from the skin, on the back of the body, move it down from top to bottom. Now, squeezing the knees together, straighten your legs and find out, is there a point at which when you straighten your legs, your, your legs wanna come apart? And if they do, or if they only wanna come apart, stop at that point and rebend and hold there, hold there. Hands face in at the side of your hips, point fingers facing down to the floor. All right, now, are you lifting your rib cage up off of your pelvis? Let me see that. If you're not sure about that, take your hands for a second, find the lowest outer corners of your ribs and lift them up off your pelvic ribs. And if you're not sure where your pelvic ribs are, stretch your fingers so like your thumbs touch the ribs and the, bottom, and the other fingers go for your pelvic ribs. That's the gap. That's where like you, you wear a cummerbund, if you have like a suit on, right? That band around your waistline, lift that up. 
Then release your hands and see the lift. Maintain the lift. Now, collapse everything. That's exactly what you don't want to do in Tadasana. So, re-energize, but now put the belt underneath the feet. Open the, t open the belt on the middle of the arches and walk your hands down the side of the belt till the arms are at full extension. Now, once you're at full extension with your arms, bend your knees again and wrap your hand one more time around the belt. And then from that, slowly, you're going to straighten your legs and pull your arms up straight at the same time. And do the same action with the knees. Bend those knees, touch. And now, as you stretch your knees straight, listen, turn the back of the calves toward each other. The back of the left calf rolls behind to the right calf. The back of the right calf rolls to the left behind itself. And then turn the inner knee toward the pinky toe. The right inner knee rolls to the right pinky toe. The left inner knee rolls toward the left pinky toe. Coordinate both those actions at the same time and then use the belt to get the extra lift. Now, this is what we call implanting the cellular memory. The contact sensation has been made by the belt and the lift in the arms. So now a part of your musculature and your skeletal system understands, oh, this is what I could be doing. All right, let go of the belt, let go of the grip. Right? So you all see when you let go of the grip, something is not activating now that was activating a moment ago. Am I correct? Yes. All right, so now without the belt, what did the belt teach you? Let go of the belt and now do the whole pose but add the extra lift that you got from the belt without the belt. Join those legs, bend the knees, touch them. Now, as you straighten, squeeze everything together, ankles together, knees together, hips together. Chin up, chest forward, navel in, widen the back waistline. Yes. Bicep side up, tricep side down. Spine in the back, move up from bottom to top. Skin of the back, move down from top to bottom. All right, don't hold your breath. Inhale, exhale, and down you go. Nicely done. Let's watch Laura. Let's put Laura through her paces. Sit on the uh, mat, dear. We're gonna do the Dandasan, Bhattakanasan, Upavishtakanasan series, yeah? Yeah. All right, so first stretch your legs out in Dandasan. Lift the buttock flesh with your hands. And um, then for a moment, put your hands like fingertip claw behind your hips to press down and lift your chest up. Very nice. And then, now just observe, this is one of her really good moves. Broaden your toes, dear. Ah, look what, oh my God. She just became like a simian. Her ape-like ancestors just ch chimed in there. That's unbelievable, okay? And look how much joy spreading her foot. That's one of my mantras, wide feet or happy feet. Look at how happy this woman is. Unbelievable. Even if it's only humanistically happening and not dharmically happening, doesn't matter. It's really nice. All right, so we're going to start in Dandasana. And by the way, is the upper body still doing Tadasana? Yes. Is the lower body still doing Tadasana? Yes. The legs are doing horizontal Tadasana. So what did you learn in the Tadasana? How are you gripping your legs together? How are the back of the calves working? How are the inner knees turning? How is the lift of the rib cage off the pelvic rims going? How is the back spine lifting from bottom to top with the back skin dropping from top to bottom? Is everybody getting how I'm trying to connect Tadasan to every posture? Muriel, I know you're getting it, but everybody else? Is there any end to the amount of details we could give to sharpen the Tadasana? No. All right, so this is gonna be a vinyasa flow, watch her. So first she's gonna start here. She's going to bend her legs at the knees and pull the feet into Baddha Konasana. And she's going to use her hands first to draw the heels closer and pull them in. And then she's going to exhale and widen her legs into Upavishta Konasana. And if she can grab the feet and pull back and up, great. Turn your hand so palm faces forward. The, uh, grab between index and thumb, grab the big toe and pull back and lift up and grip the legs equally to the floor. 
long front body. Then she'll release and she'll go back to Dandasan. And then she's going to do this faster. Baddha Konasan, Upavishta Konasan, Dandasan. Then reverse. Upavishta Konasan, Baddha Konasan, Dandasan. Everybody got it? So first I'll make you go through that a few times a little quicker, waken the energy, and then we'll stop in each posture and you give us some more details to continue to correct the theme or a flow pattern. Because even the simplest asana, if you ask the student to do a cue or an adjustment that's difficult to do, you've sharpened your practice even though we're not doing more advanced poses. These are basic level poses. These are intro level poses. Does everybody understand? You don't have to sharpen your practice by only like dropping over from headstand into a backbend or doing scorpion or whatever your, your judgment is. Oh, I'm really doing advanced yoga. No, it's advanced right now if you take yourself to another level. Got it? All right, so Dandasan, everybody. Lift up the buttock flesh and get those legs working. Hands like claws, bring them behind you. So you wrap your chest around the collarbone, widen those collarbones and then activate the inner leg. Spread, spread those toes. She's an inspiration for you to aspire to. Look at those simian-like toes, right? Some of you I can see need some pumice stone on the bottom of your feet, I can tell you that right now. All right, so now grip your legs to the floor like you did in, in Tadasan. So here, this is where my teacher would say, are you quick to catch? Did you learn something in the standing vertical tadasan that now you can put into play here? And even though these are two different poses, this is one of my teachings, every pose has a component of tadasan in it, even though every pose is different than tadasan. But certainly the poses that are symmetrical, and what do I mean by symmetrical? When you divide the body on the midline called the median plane, also known as the sagittal plane, it divides right from left. But as you know, when you're practicing, the right and left aren't mirror images of another, one another. One is thicker, one is thinner, one is stronger, one is weaker, one is closer to the midline, one is further away, or whatever questions you ask that compare the two, that is the intelligence studying itself and upgrading. So now from here- I have a question, Gabriel. Go ahead, Sarah. So as, as uh, we, Try to um, imagine the floor underneath us, and uh, like when Laura's doing this, her heels are still on the floor. Yeah. But if you engage your legs like that and your calves lift your feet up off the floor, which which should you go for? Yeah. So thank you very much. It's a good question. It's not the calves. It's actually overstretching the thigh that lifts the heel off the floor. So what you have to do is you have to stretch the top of your shin down more. And you, so you want the heels on the floor? Of course, yeah. Okay. Again, in Dandasan, right, you always start from the base of the pose. The whole back of the leg from the buttock to the heel is supposed to be contacting the floor. But obviously you don't have the foot pressing the floor like you did in the vertical, right? But you have the other actions in your leg, like squeezing the hips together, squeezing the knees together, squeezing the, the ankles together, and then centering the kneecap so it's not turned in or out, and then rolling the calf the back of the left calf still rolls to the right calf. The back of the right calf still rolls to the left calf. The inner knee still turns towards the pinky toe, like that. Got it? All right. So now, from there, lift the spine from bottom to top, drop the skin from top to bottom. All right. Exhale. Bend the legs at the knees and with your hands, bring the feet into Bhattakanasana. Pull it closer to you. Don't accept the first place it comes in. And then pull back, lift up your chest, widen your collarbones. Nice. And make sure the feet are touching completely, ball mount to the foot and the heel as well. That's another action on the groin when you let the foot come apart, keep them together. All right, and breathe. Exhale, widen your legs into Upavishta Kanasan. Right? And lift the buttock flesh if you need to, and then grab the foot but pull back and lift up. Don't make a forward bend, long front body. Every time you move the spine into a concave position, you pull the abdominal organs in and up. So especially if you're not doing inversions, 
which will help to use the g-force to move the organs from sagging from top to bottom and it'll pull them from bottom to top. Got it? So you do that in the Upavishta Konasana as well, especially if you're not doing inversions. All right, exhale, go back to Dandasan. And now let's do that. That's the warm up. Let's do it three times with a little bit more activity here. Inhale, exhale, Baddha Konasana. Inhale, exhale, Upavishta Konasana. Inhale, exhale, Dandasan. And again, inhale, exhale, Baddha Konasana. Inhale, exhale, Upavishta Konasana. Inhale, exhale, Dandasana. Now the other way. Inhale, exhale, Upavishta Konasana. Inhale, exhale, Baddha Konasana. Inhale, exhale, Dandasana. Inhale, exhale. What, what do you do next? <laughs> Thank you. Do it. Then exhale. Do the next one. Good. Then inhale, exhale. Do the next one. Good. You just took self-responsibility for learning it. Right? That's called Shruti Smirti. I listened and I remembered. You all get a gold star. You all get a gold star. Now, Bharatanasana, once again. Those of you who studied with me know that I've taken this teaching from Gita. That Baddha Konasana and Upavishta Konasana are like the dynamic duo of floor hip openers. It also teaches external rotation in one pose, internal rotation in another pose. Knee flexion in one pose, knee extension in another pose. Abduction away from the midline in one pose, adduction toward the midline in another pose. So already in just these two poses, it helps you understand the basic ranges of motion of the hips, the knees, the thighs, the shins. And of course, at the same time, it opens the groin. Groinal effervescence is back. It never goes out of uh, season. You know? It's always in good taste to open your groin. Why? Ah, well, first of all, nothing shoves sheer fact in your face as a good asana you can't do. And you can see that if you looked at everybody else's place, number two things to look for. Number one, are your heels touching your perineum? So as my teacher would say, I say no. I say no. The closer they come, the harder it is to keep your knees down toward the floor. Yeah. So here's what we're going to do. Come on, Sarah, in the pose while we're doing this. I have a, well, I have a question about, you said keep the balls and the heels together, but I have been taught that you peel the feet open and uh, to get the knees closer to the floor. It's another way of opening the groin. It's just not what's being taught this moment. Okay. All right, so now take your hands on the root of your thigh, watch Laura, and roll your thigh back, both hands on each thigh. One hand on one thigh, one hand on the other thigh. Roll it back, press it down, and pull it long toward the knee without actually moving it, without actually moving it. Then divide your thigh into the middle third of your thigh. Roll the skin back, press it down, and lengthen it toward your knee without letting the hand slide. Then go right to behind the knee on the thigh side, roll it out, press it down, and lengthen it toward the knee. And now lift your spine up and do everything that you know about Tadasan while you're holding the pose. Take three long, slow, deep breaths together. Breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. Where's the median plane of your body? Lift those rib cages up off the pelvis. Don't drop the samana vayu into the apana vayu. Inhale, exhale. All right, out you go. Very nice. Stretch out, very good. Laura, are we doing plank pose next? We thought about Vajrasana. Vaj oh, Vajrasana, okay. Another thing, very important to stretch your knees so watch what she's going to do. She's going to turn to the side and show you something. She's going to sit on her heels. Now flatten your toes, dear. So she just plunks right down. It's no problem for her. But for some of you, that might not feel so good. You might need something underneath you. But if you can touch your buttock to your heels, that's fine. But now, since the buttock is wide and the, and the heel is short, small, 
what you're going to do is when you lift your buttock flesh, what you're trying to do is move the skin and the muscle up and behind the heel toward the toe side, but the buttock bone comes to the shin side, right? As if the buttock is going to drop in front of the heel toward the shin while the rest of the skin and the flesh kind of hangs over. Everybody get that? Now, if that's tough on your shin or your knee, you can always put a blanket underneath you as a little shim. So would you show how to put a blanket underneath yourself just in case? Fold it however much, however thick you need to. So it takes some pressure off you there. Some people will find, no, no, the pressure's on the top of the foot, not on the, on the knee, in which case the blanket could go underneath your foot and shin. So show them with a blanket underneath your foot and shin. Yeah, move further forward, dear. Okay. All right. So now she, she is doing, right? And as I love to say, one part of her may say, I am doing very well. I, I got down. You asked me to do what I do. What Russian? You said put heels. I put heels on heels. It's good. Yeah. No, it's not good. Why? Because she will tell you, is the pose symmetrical in your feet or did the weight fall to the outer edge of your foot? What say you? Well, don't look, do it by feeling. Heels are spreading. My Means heel. the heel roll to the outside. Yeah. So there's more weight on the outside than the inside. Right. So this is how we're going to correct. She's going to come forward. She's going to use her fingers to push the heels together. And she's going to hold them together for as long as she can. So that when she sits down, there's a minimal amount of spreading. And now when she sits down, from your own feedback, would you say the inner heels are closer together? Yes. Now for some people, that still might not be enough to get the heels together. So now we're gonna belt the heels together. So take your belt, make a loop of the belt, and it's gonna go underneath your shin, and then tie it, not over the thigh, but it's just tying the shins together. So watch how she does this. She comes forward, she takes the belt behind her, lifts her feet, puts it underneath the shin and toes, and then ties it together tight. And I mean tight, so that the buckle ends up in the center, not on the flesh, all right? So while she's doing that, you can set this up. First, set it up by sitting on your heels and just seeing, do I need anything underneath me? Don't jump to the next thing until you find out. Then if you can easily sit and there's no problem, the second thing I said was lift the buttock flesh, but don't just lift it willy nilly and you don't know what you're doing. Move it in such a manner that the skin and the bone goes behind the heel toward the arch side of your foot. Sorry, the, the skin and the flesh go behind the heel toward the arch side of the foot, but the, the buttock bones, the sit bones, they try to go on the shin side. Now, as you do that to the best of your ability, take a couple of breaths. Do anything you know about Tadasan stacking the shoulders over the hips. And now notice the feet. Are the feet symmetrical, working symmetrically, or is the roll of the weight to the outer edge of your foot? So come forward, regardless of what you perceive. Squeeze the heels together with your hands and hold them down as far as you can. Far, keep them together as far as you can for as long as you can and sit down again. Common sense says if you need a blanket on the floor to give extra padding for your feet, shin, toes, do it. If you need extra padding behind the knee, do it. And then pause there. All right, assess how it is. And even if you think you don't need it, even if you think I'm doing very well, come out, take a belt, and tie your legs together. Give you another little tip. Tie the tail of the belt inward on the affected side. If you have a bad right toe, foot, arch, heel, shin, calf, knee, tie it in toward the midline. So if your right leg is bad, tie it so the tail goes to the left. If your left leg is bad, tie it so the tail goes to the right. And then sit down again. And again, tie it tight. That's it, Maureen. That was the face I was looking for. Now you understand. So you don't have to tie it that tight. 
you could tie it tighter progressively, right? Because again, if it distracts you, how do you know it's too tight? Did it impact your breathing? Or can you bring a modicum of control back to the pose with your breath? Remember, for a beginning student, as soon as the pose starts to devolve, you've lost your tapascharya, come out of the pose. If you're a continuing student, once the pose doesn't start to feel good, that's when the pose actually begins for you. Because you've learned how to focus your mind, channel your breath, use the cues of the teacher. Even the teacher's voice becomes a kind of free energy. Take it in. And you remember the mantra, yogis don't panic, yogis don't crumble. Now, are you really lifting your chest up off of the pelvis or are you just sinking down into your heels? A lot of times in the studio where I used to work, we had wall ropes. We would let the person hold the wall ropes because then they could lean back the weight into the buttock, but by pulling on the rope, they would lift their chest up at the same time. So just in case you're not lifting your chest, take your arms in front of you, interlock your fingers with your palms closed, stretch your arms and level with your shoulders, then inhale, stretch your arms up over your head, like Maxwell's silver hammer, and lift your rib cage up off of the legs. Yes. Chin up, chin up. Chest forward, navel back. Widen the back body. This is a pranayama tip as well. Widen the sacrum, widen the kidneys, widen the lumbars, widen the scapular. Widen the back neck, widen the back skull. If your eyes were closed, I'd say widen the back of the eyes. All right, exhale, down you go. Nice, come on out, slowly take the belt out first. And then stay on all fours. Turn your body to the side, Laura. And then watching Laura, give yourself a little extension to take the stiffness out of your knee. So you keep your left leg where it is, stretch your right leg straight back. Everybody do it at the same time. Press the palms down, lift the chest up. Shoulder sockets, hit back. Rib cage, pull forward and breathe. Make sure when you're extending your right leg back, don't raise the right hip. Slightly turn the right hip down. Keep the navel up. Okay, good. Switch legs. Breathe as you do. Maureen, you okay? Oh, getting the belt out. Okay, good. So straighten. Now lift up your chest. Come on. Collarbones go one way. Back leg goes the other way. Fill the back of the knee. The back leg does a, a deep internal rotation. That means the lateral and frontal thigh turns left to right. The upper back inner left thigh turns right to left. All right, good. Now, both legs in plank. Keep your navel into the body. Drop your tailbone, sacrum down. More tuck of the back pelvis, Muriel. More, more, more. Navel up, back waistline broad. Now, both legs active at the same time. Good, look up, Holly. Elbows firm, collarbones wide, breathing. Really important to breathe. Nothing good is gained by holding the breath. All right, are you, are you graceful? Are you elegant? Are you holding the form like it's an art, artistic presentation? So, so focus your mind and breathe. Gabriel, right. I have a bad shoulder, so can down I do you this? Exhale, come down, everybody. All right, so you have a bad shoulder. So Yeah, so can I do it on my elbow? I exactly. Mean, uh, yeah. so, so, so watch this. Watch, watch Laura for a second. Do it again, Laura, but do it with a tripod base. All right, so this is one way of doing it. Do it. Watch her for a second. All right, so now you got to drop your hips a little bit, level with your shoulders. Good. And now, from here, don't always squeeze your palms and press your wrists, pin your elbows, pull the lower arm from your fist to your elbow back toward your toes and then launch your chest forward. Okay, come down. Jennifer, let me see you do that. Got to drop your tush a little bit there. Better. Navel up, strong in the legs, firm in the legs. Good, how's that feel? 
doable. All right, now, good. So now pull from the palm to the elbow back and launch your chest in the opposite direction. Yes. Nice. That's good. Come down. Yeah. So very important. Anybody, when you're not feeling something correctly or it doesn't work for you, speak up. I really appreciate that. We can give you something to, a little bit to work on it. You know, and also, Jennifer, you can practice that instead of with the hands together, with the hands apart, like parallel, pressing down and pulling back, same way. Try that. That'll help. All right. Let's move on. Dog pose. Watch her. Do it. How are we going to sharpen the edge of the pose? Okay, come down for a second, dear. I know I'm changing what I said to do, but that's because I told her, be ready for everything, open to anything. This also says she can't go, just in case she's that kind of type A personality where she studies really good ahead of time, so she's prepared for the test, but then she's unnerved if we go off structure. No, so I want you to do dog pose again, but I want you to turn so your feet are facing the camera. Come closer to me. Come, come, come. Okay, good. Now get a block. All right. Now keep it near you. Now do dog pose. No, keep on the block on the side. All right, do dog pose. Um, walk further forward a little bit so we can see your full foot. Okay, right there. Good. Now do dog pose. All right. She is doing. Now I'm not going to say anything, right? Laura, you just keep doing. Everybody observe. You always start from the base of the pose. That's the part contacting the floor. So obviously it's the hands and the feet. So I just want to say something about the feet and then give you the technique to show you how to activate a dull or a dead part. Don't change. As my teacher would say, don't play with the pose. Look at the shape of her heels. They're both supposed to be horseshoes and centered so that the center point of the heel, the middle of the back of the knee, and the middle of the buttock bone on each leg is in one complete straight line, and then one leg compares to the other leg. Just observe whatever you think you see. Then notice that the ankle tips on the inside is called the medial malleolus, on the outside it's called the lateral malleolus. They're not supposed to be in the same plane, so don't think that they should be level inside and out on each foot. But just compare the inner ankle on one side to the an inner ankle on the other side. So if she was collapsing, it would be what we call pronating the arches. Can you collapse your arches for us, dear, even more? Mm. And if she was supinating, where the weight would be rolled to the outer edge, it would be like that. You see how each one is a distortion? Yes? Come down, my dear. Put the, come down. Put the block between your feet so the block is flat on its smallest, shortest end, flat between your feet, and move it back all the way so the, when you come up, it's just going to be the heel from the ankle tip to the heel will be touching the block. That's all. All right, so exhale, go up. Readjust. See how she pulled it further back? So the ankle tip has to be on the face side of the block. And the block should be touching just where that space between the inner ankle and the heel is. Ah, you see? So now, the spacer device is just to show you how wide. But she can touch but not activate. So now, squeeze into the block. See what just happened? Watch again. Don't squeeze. See, everybody see the drop in the collapse? Squeeze. Ah, now keep the squeeze for the rest of the pose. Stretch the toes forward. See, more action, you see? Stretch the heels back while squeezing. Oh, now obviously the shape of her legs, there aren't two perfect straight lines, but this is where everybody's anatomy is off in some way. So I want you to do dog pose this way, everybody for the first time. Come on, thank you, Laura, come on. So turn around, I wanna be, if I can, I'd like to be able to see how your heels touch the block or not. So do your dog pose first with nothing underneath you. Nothing underneath you, just do dog pose. Jennifer, do you need to do it with your arms in that same tripod position? No problem. Go ahead. All right. 
So once you're up, the first thing is to notice how are your arms and legs working? So this is a sneaky way to keep students in the pose longer. And I don't even have to give you anatomical details. I can just ask you for simple questions that compare one side to the other without confusing you about anatomy. Feel the weight in your right hand. Feel the weight in your left hand. Are they symmetrical? Or is more weight on the pinky toe side, pinky finger side, more weight on the thumb index finger? just like when we did the bending of the legs in the Vajrasana. Then compare and contrast, and then to the best of your ability, make them equal actors. Now, keeping that going, what you've created, don't destroy. Look at your feet. Is one foot wider, one foot longer? How is it working? Are the toes stretched forward? Are the heels stretched back? Notice what they're doing. Look at the shape of the leg from the top center quadricep muscle to the middle of the kneecap to the foot between the two ankles, where's the midline on the front of your leg? Compare the two to each other. And then on the back of your leg, from the center of the heel to the middle of the back of the knee to the center of each buttock bone, what do you perceive? How is the front and the back of the leg lined up with each other? And then compare the two legs for each other. All right, exhale, down you go. Put the block between your feet and do the second variation. So the block is on its lowest edge. The small or short edge of the block faces forward toward your eyes and backward toward your feet. You're going to move the block back behind you so the front edge of the block is between the ankle tip and the heel. The rest of the block is behind you. Now, before you even do anything, go back to what you just learned. Make the weight of the hands the same Make the weight of the legs the same. Now, touching the block is not the same as squeezing into the block. So squeeze into the block. What just happened? Now observe your anatomy. Watch with your eyes. Watch with your legs. Watch your eyes with your legs. Use your visual intelligence for what you can. Now, let go of the grip of the block. See what just spread? Now, grip it again. Everything just got drawn into the midline. Is it not so? Keep that there. Keep that there. Squeeze the hips, squeeze the knees. Yes, and let your head relax. Don't over tuck your chin, but let your head relax. Three long, slow, deep breaths while you're here. Inhale and exhale. Roll those calves and turn those knees like you've learned in the other poses. It's still like Tadasana. Inhale and exhale. Sarah, you really need to have a block between your knees because your outer knees are caving in. So for you, Sarah, wait, for you, what I would say, stay there, stay there, stay there. Everybody else come down. For you, what I would say is squeeze the feet, but pull the knees apart. Yeah, right, stay there, it's starting to come, right? Oh, yes, if you had like a thin block, that would really help. Or come down for a second, Sarah. Put the block between your knees. Short end facing, foot. there you go. Now go up into dog again. Now... Try to, ah, uh, you see, you see how the feet are much more in a parallel position? See how I did that? So this is why each student's body needs to be dealt with on an individual basis. And why truly having a teacher is so much better than a good book or a tape. Because not only can't you ask questions to a good book or a tape, but the tape or the good book isn't seeing what you're actually doing. And you can come down now, dear. And it isn't that we're, assuming you're filled with self-deception, but there's just a lot of feedback that your body doesn't know. There are dead zones, right? right? Dark areas, dark holes. We don't know. Somebody else sees that. And again, you can't see the back of your body. So they tell you that, oh, now I realize what I could have been doing, right? It's so clear once it's shown you. Anyway, thank you. That was a good, good variation. I hope you understood something about that. All right, what's next, dear? Oh, the Vrikshasan stuff. Oh my God, we really have it in for you now. What? Watch, look, she loves this one. Watch this one. All right, so first, stand, stand up in Vrikshasan. Here's one of the games I like to play. First, away from the wall. And just uh, focus, do your Tadasan, get your balance, whatever. And then uh, focus your gaze. Your drishti is important. Then inhale, bring your right leg up. Exhale to the left thigh and balance freestanding in Vrikshasan. 
And then she's doing namaste position. She's breathing. She's happy. And then she stretches her arms up over her head and does Urva Hastasana. She lifts those rib cages up off of the waistline, and increases the space. And so in terms of like, see how high she got her bent leg foot up into the root of the groin, really nice. And then exhale, come down, take a breath there. And let's just see the other side for a quick bilateral comparison. Inhale, exhale, up she goes. And there she is. She pauses. She stretches up. And even if I tell you, you know, resist your bent foot into your straight thigh, resist your straight thigh into your bent foot, activate a couple of areas. Now, which side do you feel more secure on? Which side is less wobbling? This one or the other one? I'm not sure. Yeah, on the front side. So this was her stronger side. So now watch what happens. Because this has to do with why am I about to teach you this new variation? Go up once again. So one of the things we learn in, in applying yo do the yeah, yoga philosophy to the asana, right? You can just stay there, right? Is the second yoga sutra defines yoga as chitta vritti nirodha, the cessation of the fluctuation of the mind stuff, right? Vrittis mean the waves in the mind. And because there's supposed to be a one-to-one -one correspondence, right? A st stable pose means the breath will be stable because an uncalm breath is always reflective of a pose that's instable, unstable. So if you look at her foot on the standing leg, is it stable or is it wobbling? See, just, to, just bringing your awareness to it starts wobbling, you see? But also her hips are not in tadasan. Even though it's an asymmetrical pose, she has her bent leg hip high and the pelvis tilted. So come down. So now we're gonna turn, she's gonna use the wall to her left so you can see the, the uh, angle. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna come close enough to the wall that the left leg knee comes up into vrikshasana and you're close enough to the wall that you can get the foot to the knee to the wall and use your other hand to pause and wedge yourself there for a second. Then you wait and you breathe. Then you bring your standing leg directly underneath your hip. And now what she has to do, she doesn't have to worry about the balance because the knee is wedging her and you see how much more stable your right ankle is. Everybody t tell everybody how much more stable the ankle is. Yeah, definitely. You're not just saying that to curry favor with me. It really is more stable, isn't it? It is because I'm not worried about falling. Right, oh, that's good. So now take your left hand to the left thigh and to the front of the left, the top third of the left thigh, top, I'm sorry, bottom third of the left thigh, press it forward on the wall and down. Forward yeah, in the direction your eyes are facing. Come on, more, more forward and down. Toward that piece, yeah, yeah, better, stop right there. Toward that piece of furniture, whatever you got there in front of you. Move it in that direction and down. Ah, look at what happened to her pelvis. She just got her pelvis in Tadasana, you see? So this variation teaches you what is it like to have the hips in the same plane, the standing leg directly underneath you like Tadasana, and no wobbling in the pose. So now she goes Namaste, and she takes her arms up over her head. Now she can do the pose much more from Prana and Chitta. She can watch much more the breath because it's undisturbed and any of the other mental states that may arise because the pose is stable. So she, her attention is free to pay attention to what's going on in her mind, the fluid part of her attention, rather than, oh, I'm always aware of my, my, my ankle is, is rolling, my balance is off, this hip is high. She doesn't have to pay attention to that now. Good work, Laura. Everybody else, come on, let's do it. All right, so first time I want you to just do vrikshasan freestanding. I want you to get the sense of the two sides together. Start in Tadasan, get the symmetrical sense. And then inhale, exhale, take the right foot up. Inhale, exhale, take it to the left leg. Pause there for a second, get your balance. The foot is against the inside of the thigh, Nancy. It's not an Ardha Padmasan. There you go. Now pause with your hands in Namaste and notice how much tilt there is into the outer edge of the left foot. 
So of course, as you press the right foot into the left thigh and the left thigh into the right foot, you can lean a little bit more your left hip towards your right knee. And then even though the game is to take the thigh or the thigh bone back behind you to the right, that doesn't mean that you roll your right hip socket that way. And this is what the wall is gonna teach you. The thigh has to come back, but eventually you gotta to learn to keep the hips in the parallel position. Now, stretch your arms up over your head like Urdhva Namaskar or Urdhva Hastasan, palm together, palm apart, I don't care. And lift those rib cages off of the wobbly foot. All right, exhale, namaste, down you come. Take a breath. So that was the right side. All right, erase that, forget it. It's in the past now. Center into Tadasana again. Clear your mind, God is looking for a vacancy. All right, inhale, exhale, inhale, take the left leg up. Get it as high in the thigh, compare this side to the other side right away. Jennifer, try to get your left foot on the inside of the thigh so the toes are not on the front of the thigh at all. Resist left foot into right thigh, right thigh into left foot, wait there. Square the hips as best as you can. That means you have to drop the left hip, but challenge the left knee thigh back and lean the right hip toward the midline. Feel the difference in the wobbliness of this foot compared to the other. Then take the arms up over your head and reach, reach. Get the rib cage up off the pelvis. Yeah, enjoy, stretch up. All right, enough. Inhale, exhale, namaste, down you go. And take a breath. All right, so now turn yourself so the right side can face the wall. And then inhale, exhale to prepare. Inhale, take the right leg up. Exhale, put it on the inner thigh. Get close enough to the wall that you can wedge your knee against the wall. You can use your right hand on the wall too to give you some balance first. And then to the best of your ability, walk your left leg underneath you so that from the side view, your outer ankle, outer knee, and outer hip in one straight vertical line. Stack the shoulders over the hips. Good. Now, draw a mental straight line from your left pelvic rim horizontally across to where the wall is. So you want your knee to be slightly in front of that. So this is to teach you how to square the hips. So with your right hand, go on the bottom third of the right thigh, push it slightly down and move it slightly forward along the wall in the direction your eyes are looking. See what that did to your pelvis. I made Laura do that two or three times till you really get a sense that the right hip is in the same line with the left hip and the pelvic rims are facing inward. Good. Then straightening that left leg any amount you can. Inhale, exhale, take your arms up in Urdhva Hastasana or Urdhva Namaskar. You can do any one of the arm variations. Chin up in space, chest forward in space, navel back in space, and broaden the back body. All right, exhale, namaste, down you go. Take a breath in between, turn the other side. Take an inhale, exhale as a transition. And then with a second inhale, raise the foot up. Exhale, put it on the, th the thigh. I'd rather you have your foot lower on the leg, but still have the whole foot ball mount and heel touching so the arch can be nice. Don't take the foot up higher and it co collapses the foot. Or as my teacher would say to me when he would see me in a pose, do not mar the beauty of the asana with the ugliness of your presentation. <laughs> That's a good one-liner to keep forever, right, Muriel? Chin up, chin up, Maureen. Chin up, test forward, navel in, back waistline. So two or three times, guide that knee, the lower third of the knee, forward and down. So the hip starts coming more and more in line with the right leg. Exactly. Squaring the pelvis. Exactly. You got it, Holly. You got it, Jennifer. Hi, welcome, Greg. I have a question about... Uh... So I'm really bow-legged on the right. My right leg's a little shorter. So yeah. the shin is really curved. Yeah, so what I would do is, I would, uh, for your body, I would take a block and put the block between the wall and the outer top right calf and then try to move the lower shin and foot closer to the wall so it would make your leg go straight. All right, everybody, inhale, exhale, come on down. Let's see if Greg can do this for a second, if you want to be the, be the model, yeah? So drop the calf one more time. 
Right? Right. So he, had, he had a bad bow leg to the outside, right? So, mm -hmm. you, so it's the right leg? Yeah. So turn and face the door on the right side. Then get the block and put the block between the door and the outer top right calf. Yeah, wedge it in. Yeah, and now see if you can go up. Use your left, right hand on the door to give you stability and then have the right hand higher up on the door. There you go. Now, lift up the left leg and see if that'll help. Now, is there any way you can, even a nano inch, move your right foot and right ankle toward the door while the block is preventing the shin from bowing out too much? How's that? I'm holding myself up more with my arm on the wall, actually. Well, not, that's not working for you. No, because if I let go, I completely... All right. Understood. So again, what I would do for you is I would do this in Dandasan, right? Because the bow leg is going to show up when you're sitting, when you're non-weight bearing as well. So first I would do it in Dandasan, where I would probably put the block um, between your knees and then tie the belt to pull the right calf in. Right. So like that. But you'd have to have, a, you have to have your feet wider too. So you put a small block between your feet and a block there and then see that. Yeah, exactly. Then if you squeeze the belt, uh, tie the belt and that'll pull the shin in. And mm -hmm. You can train the bone that way. All right, let's move on. Um, Thanks. Getting down to like eight minutes left. You got to invert. So I'm, I'm letting go of Hastapada one. We got to invert. Um, again, you know, I hope you understand that I'm more interested in you teaching than in just doing. That's what makes every class like a workshop, like a learning experience, right? If you just do too many poses to think that you get a good practice and rather than sharpening the edge of the practice by doing fewer poses, but working on them and diving more deeply, I think that's more important than just giving you a good workout. I always like to say a, a class or a workshop, it isn't a workout. It's a learning experience to get challenged by doing new things you've never done before. Remember, I always say learn and grow. What does that mean? Did you hear something I said today that you never heard before? That's how you learn. Intellectually, I came upon a new word, a new concept. I didn't know that before. But grow means I did something I never did before. I went somewhere, you know, to boldly go where my body never went before. So hopefully every class you learn and you grow. If that means doing less poses, but learning them better, uh, I think I'm serving you well to draw that out of you. So I like to always do Sirshasan, right? I'm a big fan of inversions, but I like to break inversions down for what I call the inversion of verse. And although you're all students, I never know in, in what I call the Whitman sampler, the Forrest Gump of uh, who shows up into the chocolate box every class. Some people can do headstand independently. Some people are, can get against the wall. Some people can only um, do it if there's head is hanging down, like through a, a sling or one of those uh, inversion. But you gotta be able to break it down so that if you're averse to that, dog pose was an inversion. You didn't feel hurt doing that. Well, if you're properly prepared, if the methodology takes you step by step, Shirshasan, they call it the king of the asanas. They wouldn't afford an epithet to, to that pose if it didn't have major benefits. But I'm not cavalier. You have to do this in a way where you don't hurt yourself. So Laura, who's been through the, she's been baked in the fire of asana. I gave her a can of whoop ass the other day. Oh my God. You should have seen she was sweating bullets. So what she's going to do, she's going to show you first without the wall, interlock your fingers like Jennifer did, palm presses down, knuckles right to the wall, elbows pin in, round the upper back, do dog pose, stop right there. Right away, your head should be hanging free with no pressure on your neck. Is that correct, Laura? Yeah. Now, just like dog pose, where your chest moves towards your legs, walk your feet in toward yourself, but move your chest toward your legs. Stop right there. Now you see how her chest moved toward the wall? Everyone will, everyone's will. So challenge your chest again toward your legs. Ah, even if it's just a nano inch, any movement's an achievement. Very good. Once again, not letting your chest retreat, walk your legs in again. 
So it retreated a little bit. She has to relaunch her chest. See, each time. I'm very picky. I'm not going to tell her you did a good job when her chest didn't move in the right direction. That doesn't serve her. That's, that's giving her a pass instead of holding her accountable, which if she says, I, you're my teacher, that means I'm supposed to hold you accountable, right? So she did it. Well, and then when you can get no further, because your hamstrings can't go, lift your heels as if you're rolling your buttock. No, no. Lift your heels off the floor more, as if you're rolling your ah, rolling the buttock over the kidney, and stretch your chest one more time. Uh, and down you go. That's stage one. How's your neck feel? So good? Yeah, it's okay. All right, now she's going to take the block, and she's going to hold it with her two fingers on either side. And notice how she puts the block above her head, and she barely holds the block. And notice she has the short end facing the wall and her back. And she's going to exhale, hold it until she can lift up and wedge it into her back. But wait, wait, wait. The block is on an angle, so it's not correct. Come down. Start it flush to the wall right away before you go up. And higher, and higher, and higher, and higher. Now go up. No, and you, no, you got to, all right, however you do it, you got to figure it out. Ah, much better. Now it's cleared. All right, she's lost it a little bit. This is what I don't like about the foam block. But walk in. Ah, now it, it tilted, you understand? So she's still, she's still perfecting the, uh, the horizontality of the block. You still got to do where your elbows are on the floor and the block is as high up as you can at the same time. Do it with both arms at the same time, if you can. So it's not there yet, all right. But you get the idea, you'll walk in, it'll give tremendous support to your upper back. Laura, have both elbows on the floor simultaneously. Okay. And then barely hold it with the fingers. Then walk in. Right. So by practice, it's getting better and better. See, the it's still off a little bit in the back, but she's getting better and better. So with practice, it improves. Come on, everybody do it. Thank you. All right. First time without anything underneath you. Interlock your fingers. Knuckles right to the wall. Press the wrist bone down. Pin the elbow in. Lift the shoulders up. Drop the head, round that upper back. Then exhale, do dog pose and walk in a bit. Wait there, stop, look at your legs. Launch your chest back toward your legs. Then once again, press the middle of the wrist bone down, not on the hand side, not on the forearm side. Pin the elbows in there, no wider than your armpit. Keep lifting the shoulders and then walk the feet in again. And launch the body toward the legs again. The head should be clearly off the floor no one should have any problem about neck. So now it's all about strengthening your arms and shoulders. Good. Look at the leg pose. Is the tadasan in the legs? What are your legs doing that's like tadasan? How come the legs are not together? Didn't we teach legs together in tadasan? What did you learn about the calf? What did you learn about the knee? What did you learn about squeezing the legs together? All right, inhale, exhale, and down you come. All right, so now the only difference is we're going to use the block to strengthen the upper back so that we are planting the cellular memory that says to your body, you know, my shoulders feel really good. I have no pain in my neck. I'm going to do this till I feel so confident that one day my teacher will say, now it's time to be on the crown of your head. And you'll say, how high do you want me to jump? Because you've been guided step by step and you don't feel any threat to your neck. So you say, okay, I'm ready for the next level. So once again, Bend your, come onto the floor, interlock the fingers, knuckles to the wall. That's how far you need to be away. From that position, lift the block up and barely alight your fingers on it, just enough to hold it above your head and get it flush to the wall. Go a little higher. Holly, go a little higher. Then with an exhale, walk in with your legs, wedge it in place. Make sure it's absolutely horizontal. Good. And then interlock your fingers and walk in again. If at first you don't succeed, try, try again. That's it, Greg. Nice. Now walk your legs in again. And wait there. Join the inner leg. Inner heels, Muriel. Inner heels, Jennifer. Grip the back of the leg. Walk your legs in again. See, see how your chest gets support. See how your shoulders are lifting. Your head should be hanging and there should be nothing going on in your neck except freedom. All the inner organs reversing their flow, getting used to having blood in your head. Clarify your head. Clarify your brain. 
It's like a, it's a, like a fresh, a shower. All right, one more time. If you can't walk in anymore, just lift your heels up toward the buttock, roll the buttock over the kidney and take a few more breaths. And be relaxed in your face. Don't get apoplectic in your face. Come on, join those heels together as best as you can, Sarah. All right, take a breath, inhale, exhale. Slowly come down on your knees, let the block come down, reach up with your hands, and then do child's pose to relax your face, relax your cranials. All right, inhale, exhale, come on up. If you do not have a bolster, get a couple of blankets. Laura, I forgot what we practiced, so I'm just gonna, once again, just flow with it. Okay, we're flowing. First, put a block. If you have a bolster and a block, do it this way. If you don't have blankets, it's the same thing, but with blankets. First, put a block against the baseboard where it meets the wall as a spacer device. Turn it up on its side edge there, second height. Then, then put a bolster flush against that, short ends of the bolster facing the side walls. So she has a bolster, she puts the bolster in front of the block first. I'm working with blankets, Gabriel, so All it's right. one so thing. it's the same thing. Now, if you have blankets, you fold the blanket from standard fold to single fold, and you stack two or three of them together, and you put the closed edges of the blankets on the same side, the fringe edges on the same side, and you turn the blankets the other way. Short ends of the blankets face the side walls. You have the blankets vertical. You turn them horizontally. This way. this way. That's it. So now there's a space between the bolster and the block. So now remove the block because you want to drop your buttock into that space and then sit on the side of the bolster or the blankets. And then face, when you tuck yourself down to the floor, go to one side, hold the forearm elbow down to prevent you from falling and grab the other side of the bolster or the blanket with your hands to bring yourself into the wall, right? So drop one for, there you go. And then slide back, drop the buttock down, and hopefully the blank of the bolster isn't so wide that your shoulder blades can't come to the floor. Head, shoulders, shoulder blades to the floor. Buttocks up, uh, down toward the wall and feet up. Vipritta Karni, inverted leg. So we're a few minutes beyond two o'clock. So although I love to do Shavasan, a restorative pose works on your nervous system the same as Shavasan. And Vipritta Karni is the prototype of all restorative poses. So you learn a lot about Shavasan, even in a pose like this. Now, there's something active in every passive pose. So with your thumbs, touch to the top of the thigh, just below the pelvic rim, and push that whole area toward the wall. And as you do, drop your buttock bone down at the same time, yes. Then release your hands back to your side, activate your legs, do Tadasana in your legs, so we've done Tadasana with the legs standing, Tadasana with the legs horizontal, and now Tadasana with the legs up the wall. Shoulder sockets hit down, shoulder blades gently puff up. And if you're not sure how to get that lift, bend your arms at the elbows with the palms facing each other and the fingertips facing the ceiling. And then pressing straight down from the fingertips to the elbows, push the tricep shoulder to the floor, you'll see the chest go up. And then release the hands without losing the chest lift. So for the teachers, remember, that's what I call giving a technique. 
Don't just say the words, lift your chest, puff your chest. Some students don't get it. The technique is bending the arm, pressing the elbow, then the chest puffs up, then they understand exactly what to do. Remember, because you have to find out for yourself. So now close your eyes and once again, move into the back of your skull, the base of your skull, the back of your eyes, the base of your eyes. Even Shavasana has to be held to a high standard of precision. Most beginners are just happy to class is over, they just conk out. But every pose, remember, is a potential to experience the core of your being. But if you fall asleep, you can't do that. No one's home to collect. But you want to win the lottery, you got to be present to collect. As you get ready to come back to your daily life, let's take a moment to use the power of affirmation. The end of every yoga session is a golden opportunity to program your own biocomputer by telling yourself what you need to hear and recognizing through the law of attraction that which you focus on, the law of attraction helps to be more because that which is like unto itself is drawn. Our affirmation for today is about joyful appreciation. I'm happy joyful and appreciative. I beat the drum of what I want. I follow my bliss. I look for reasons to feel good. I find something in the moment to be happy about. I master and embody the art of letting in well-being. And because I do so, all my experiences connect me to living spirit. I'm happy, joyful, and appreciative. And so it is my joyfully appreciative friends. May you all beat the drum of what you want, both humanistically and dharmically. May you all follow your bliss. May you all find reasons to feel good. Find something in the moment to be happy about. May you all master and embody the art of letting in well-being. And because of that, may you honestly be able to say, when you leave here today, all my experiences connect me to living, exper living spirit. And that's why I am happy, joyful, and appreciative. May it ever be so. All right. If you've drifted off and lost conscious contact with your breath, slowly float your awareness back to the inhale and exhale cycles. Notice how every inhale has an animating, uplifting, and charging effect. Every exhale has a tranquilizing, calming, and sedating one. Every new inhale, come back closer to being grounded in the body, but yet every exhale reminds you that you're anchored in the peace that you're feeling inside now, which is called Shanti. Bend the legs at the knees, put the feet on the floor. Uh, on the wall, press yourself by lifting your head so you don't get caught on the mat. Slide back to your buttock is onto the floor and bring your knees into your chest. Take a breath, roll to your side, head down, chin down, heart down, take a breath there. Don't come up quickly. 
But after another breath, when you feel like you're ready, tuck your chin to your chest, use your arms to come up and just sit in namaste for a moment. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming and joining today. Thank you so much again for Muriel creating the satsang to draw from. Thank you, Laura, so much for being the model for everybody today. Thank everybody for taking all the time that you took out. I hope this serves you well. And even though we're a little bit over, um, I apologize for that. If you have to leave, bye-bye, but I'll stay here for a few minutes. If anybody wants to continue to ask a question, make a comment or anything, there's nothing off the table, whether it's yogically or not, but of course, I'd prefer yogically because then I don't have to go too far out of my own, my wheelhouse to try to say something that might be helpful to you. All right. Otherwise, we'll see you again sometime in the future and um, keep your practice going. For those of you who don't know, subscribe to my website, gabrielhalpern.com. Um, I have a lot of free things. You can cherry pick uh, Dharma talks and affirmations and podcasts. And if you'd like to subscribe, you'll get a free video of pranayama every morning. And... Um, now we'll take it from there. But I'd love to hear from any or all of you if you want to make the extension. Uh, I'm a busy person, so that means I can always get back to you. You want something done, ask a busy person. Um, and it's really a pleasure to connect to everybody. So thank you for those you have to leave, but otherwise unmute yourself and say hello or make a comment and question and see you up ahead somewhere. And then we'll, we'll send the re recording to you. Right, Laura? Yes. yes, we will. Great. Thank you. Peace to you. Good to you. Thanks, thank you all. Hey, Laura and Gabriel, could we um, also get the um, the affirmation that you read? I will send it to Laura and she can send it to every, yes, do you have everybody's uh, email? Yes. Okay. okay, thank you. That would be lovely. Thank you appreciate very much. It. I appreciate that. Thank you. But remember, you can go to my affirmations archive and like download all the different ones by topics. I have like, I have, th I think I have like six different joyful ones and Mm. All positive affirmations. So feel free to cherry pick there, but I, we will send it right away. As soon as okay. Get... And that's on your site, those affirmations? Absolutely. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Peace to you. Hi, Nancy. Fast. Thanks again. Thanks, Laura. Oh, Thank you, Sarah. Good to see you. Yeah. Thank you. It was great. Okay. Who do you got on your chest there? You got some rock and roll heroes or... Uh, my mother-in-law, who's now 90, when she was the homecoming queen at Ripon College. Oh, I love it. What a fantastic way to commemorate her life. Yeah. That's beautiful. Great. So tell me, what was fantastic for you? I never like to take general compliments. What did you connect uh, to? Um, I like the way... Uh,